The following program is brought to you by Stetson University College of Law, the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and the Law, and was funded by the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance Capital Case Litigation Initiative. Welcome to Certification and Accreditation Essentials, the seventh in our series of webinars for the Bureau of Justice Assistance Capital Litigation Initiative, Crime Scene to Courtroom Forensics Training. This webinar is produced by the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and the Law and the Office of Professional Education at Stetson University. I am your host, Ken Melson. I'm a professor at George Washington University Law School, and I taught both law and forensic science courses during my 35-year association with GWU. Today's webinar will provide attorneys with important information about the accreditation process for crime laboratories, as well as an overview of the certification of individual forensic science practitioners trained in specific disciplines. Our panelists will present the training requirements and standards for each process and discuss the benefits of certification and accreditation. Our discussion on accreditation will explore the importance of developing a culture of quality and how that can positively affect forensic science service providers, while certification will examine the scope of the programs, which vary depending on the discipline. Our panelists will provide insight into how accreditation and certification information may impact courtroom proceedings. Joining me today on the panel are Robert J. Garrett and Laurel J. Farrell. Detective Lieutenant Robert J. Garrett, who is now retired, served over 30 years in law enforcement. Before retiring, he was the supervisor of the crime scene unit of the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office in New Jersey. Lieutenant Garrett authored many articles relating to crime scene subjects and testified as an expert on a variety of forensic disciplines. He has lectured at state, regional, and international conferences and serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Forensic Identification. He is past president of the International Association for Identification and currently serves as the director of the IEI's Forensic Certification Management Board. Lieutenant Garrett is certified by the IEI as a senior crime scene analyst and a certified latent print examiner and has his own consulting business providing services to both the public and private sectors. Laurel J. Farrell currently serves as the Senior Accreditation Program Manager for the ANSI ASQ National Accreditation Board, known as ANAB, Forensics Accreditation Programs. She began her work in laboratory accreditation with the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board, known as ASCLAD Lab, in September of 2008. Ms. Farrell previously served as Accreditation Program Manager for the Calibration Accreditation Program and continues to serve as a lead assessor for ANAB forensic assessment activities and as an instructor for ANAB forensic courses on ISO IEC 17025 version 2005. ANAB forensic accreditation requirements measurement traceability and measurement uncertainty. In 2016, Ms. Farrell received the Doug Lucas Award for her significant contributions to in the crime laboratory accreditation process. She serves as the Society of Forensic Toxicologists representative on the Forensic Science Standards Board for the Organization of Scientific Area Committees for Forensic Science initiative led by the National Institute 
of Standards and Technology, as you all know, is NIST. While the webinar is in progress, you can chat with us at any time. Use the chat feature found on the right side of your login screen. We will answer as many of your questions as possible. But please note that we may not get to all of your questions while on the air. However, we will answer all the questions that you send to us, and a question and answer document will be sent to all participants by email. This webinar is designed for both prosecutors and defense attorneys. Attendees who complete this webinar will be eligible for continuing legal education credits. The Stetson Office of Professional Education will work with each individual participant for reporting specific CLE applications, and they will be made to, the, to Florida and other states per individual requests. Please email OPE at law.stetson.edu. That's OPE at law.stetson.edu for further information and for state-specific requests. So now we'll begin our program here, and we're going to start with certification first, which helps examiners become more proficient and competent in their particular discipline. So, Bob, I'd like to turn it over to you if you could explain to us the certification process and what IAI does. Okay. Well, first, let's look at what is certification. And essentially, certification is a process whereby an individual can be tested uh, regarding their knowledge and skills related to the accomplishment of specific tasks. Certification, it requires a certain level of training specifically related to the discipline. It also requires experience in the practice of the discipline. And certification requires the maintenance and supplement of knowledge and skills. And it requires a periodic renewal. With the uh, II certification programs, that renewal occurs every five years. And certification is not a guarantee. Just because someone is certified does not mean that they uh, cannot make mistakes or that uh, you know, their opinions are to be taken with impunity. So what does certification offer? Well, it gives you a practitioner that is specifically trained in the discipline that they practice, a practitioner with experience applying the underlying principles and techniques of the discipline, a practitioner who has demonstrated to their peers the knowledge and skill necessary to reliably conduct an examination or analysis related to their discipline a practitioner who follows the professional guidelines and standards related to their discipline, and very importantly, a practitioner who adheres to the Code of Professional Conduct and Ethics. All right, so Bob, let me stop here just for a second. With respect to your second to the last bullet point, what professional guidelines do they follow as a result of being certified by IAI? These are guidelines and standards which are developed usually by um, professional groups like the scientific working groups and uh, now a lot of that work is being done by the OSACs um, and it's these standards to which uh, we expect uh, people who are certified uh, to actually uh, uh, perform their examinations their analyses and so on all right and my second question there is with respect to the codes of professional conduct does yes. a person who is certified have to follow the IEI code of professional conduct or are they required to follow their own agency's professional conduct code? Well, of course, they're going to have to follow their own agency's code, but uh, if they are a member of the IAI, there is a specific uh, code in, of um, professional conduct, a standard professional conduct, and a code of ethics that they have to abide by. And within the, uh, if they are not members of the uh, IAI's, uh, you know, general membership, they also have to, as part of the being a certified person, uh, sign and adhere to a code of uh, professional conduct and standard of ethics. Does IAI have a, an enforcement mechanism for its code of professional responsibility? Yes, we do. If, if there are any complaints um, that are made against an individual with relating, relating either to their performance as a certified person or an ethical complaint, uh, 
there's actually a mechanism called a professional review board that meets. Uh, they will evaluate uh, both sides within, within the um, uh, complaint process, has an opportunity to address the issues, and then they will decide whether or not there's any merit to the complaint. Could result in a person being um, uh, disciplined in some fashion from a letter of censor uh, all the way up to uh, revoking the uh, certification. Right. Thank you. So there may be various certification programs out there for a particular discipline. So which program uh, is important for you to uh, uh, consider when looking to have people uh, certified? <clears throat> so obviously we want a program that is recognized by the professional community. We don't want something that's coming from the uh, back of popular mechanics or uh, uh, you know, some fly-by-night outfit. A program which is based on testing and evaluation, not on membership. This is important because there are some so-called professional um, groups out there that offer what they consider as a certification, and the only qualification is that you become a member of their association. Uh, that is not the case here. There's testing and evaluation. Uh, membership is uh, not a requirement for certification in any of the uh, uh, II uh, programs. You want to make sure that it, it is a program that is administratively and financially sound, a program with a track record, a program that adheres to accepted standards of management and participation, and if possible, a program that is accredited, uh, something like the uh, ISO 17024 standard. Now, with respect to your certification programs and the IAI, um, it is independent of the person's home agency. Is that correct? And, That's correct, and, yes. And why is that important to have an independent third party uh, do the certification of these examiners? So that we don't have any undue influence on the uh, part of the uh, people who are participating in the certifying process. Uh, it's a third party. Nobody else from the uh, home agency is involved with it. And um, this way we can uh, make sure that we maintain those uh, uh, the strict um, um, testing environment. Uh, for when the people apply for certification. So certification is in addition to the agencies, the home agencies' competency tests and an accreditation's proficiency tests. That's this correct. Is, this is a third party, completely separate, independent program. Right. Thank you. Now the uh, association that I represent, the International Association for Identification, it's been around a long time, over 100 years. Uh, we celebrated our centennial back in uh, 2015. Uh, we currently have over 7,000 members from 77 different countries, uh, and the IAI uh, remains the oldest and largest forensic science uh, identification association in the world. Our mission is to associate persons who are actively engaged in the profession of forensic identification, investigation, and scientific examination of physical evidence, in an organized body so that the profession in all its branches may be standardized and effectively and scientifically practiced. Now that's a mouthful and the rest of this goes on to uh, be a little more specific of some other things that we uh, do and that we encourage. But essentially it's a professional association uh, designed to bring people uh, uh, together so that they can share their ideas, so that they can participate in educational conferences and uh, also um, uh, receive our uh, publications which uh, detail uh, cases, new procedures, and so on. So the IEI has managed certification programs for over 40 years now. Uh, the first program was the Latent Fingerprint Identification Program, which was established in 1977. Uh, and we currently also have certification programs in the disciplines of crime scene investigation, uh, footwear impression, forensic art, forensic photography and imaging, forensic video, uh, blood stain pattern analysis, and 10 print identification. Uh, there are currently over 3,000 practitioners participating <clears throat> in uh, one of the uh, IEI certification programs worldwide. Each of our certification programs consists of a rigorous educational process, a certification procedure, and a recertification requirements. Uh, each is administered by a certification board that is comprised of experts in the discipline, 
all programs operated under the supervision of the board that I head, which is the Forensic Certification Management Board. Uh, it's a subdivision of the International Association for Identification, uh, and its primary purpose is to ensure compliance with international accreditation standards. What is the normal uh, process for the educational uh, requirements that they do as part of the certification? It's going to depend on the specific discipline that's involved, um, but there are uh, the uh, individual certification boards will specify specific areas of training uh, that they have determined are necessary for a person to have as part of their background uh, before they can uh, apply for uh, certification. All right. So when you are taking the certification program, is, the, is, is there a written test? Are there reading materials? What is the uniform or normal approach to the training for the certification? or the testing for the certification? All of, all of the programs have a written test component, and um, those programs that involve a, uh, an actual physical examination of evidence also have a skill uh, portion mm -hmm. of that program. All right. And then for recertification, how often do you become recertified? You recertify every five years. It requires uh, continuing education credits uh, during that five-year period. And in the, um, again, the, uh, the disciplines that require uh, the examiner to make a comparative analysis, there's also a skill uh, portion of the uh, recertification test. All right, so many forensic service providers don't have a retesting program every couple years for their analysts. So this is complementary to that. It makes sure that they're, they maintain their proficiency over a period of years as well as their competency. That's correct. And we all know that you know, even as, as we age, um, our, our visual acuity isn't what it used to be and, and so on. So it's making sure that the, uh, the people that, um, uh, especially relying on things like uh, you know, their vision and, and what have you, uh, that they're, uh, they're still competent um, you know, years down the road. Uh, and they're not, we're, we don't just grandfather people into the, um, uh, into the certification and program. And I assume there are, there are new techniques that are developed in five-year increments or so that you make sure that they're um, qualified to do and competent to do. Absolutely. During that five-year period, they're required to accumulate, uh, and it depends on the program, but so many um, uh, continuing education credits. Uh, they can achieve these through participation in uh, associations like the, uh, like the IAI, uh, they can go for additional training, they can write papers, they can make presentations and so on, and get a certain amount of, of credit toward their uh, recertification uh, based upon those activities. And in most of your programs, you have to have two years of experience? Before you can apply for the initial, um, for the initial certification, certification, yes. And that two years does not include their training period in their own laboratory? That's correct. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of the, the structure of the IAI. Um, this was changed just a, uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, we separated out the um, certification programs from the other activities of the IAI. Uh, you can see it's uh, somewhat uh, quasi-autonomous <coughs> from the other sections of the IAI, and we currently have what's known as a management services agreement with the uh, um, with the management sector of the IAI to provide us with certain uh, administrative and uh, technical uh, support. So our first certification program that we ever had uh, was the latent print certification. And these are the folks that uh, get tested um, both on their ability to process evidence for latent fingerprints and if they do develop anything, uh, to make a comparison between what is developed and the, uh, the known record of a uh, potential suspect. Our next one is the crime scene certification. And this one is a, a bit different from the others uh, because it has three different levels. Um, the first level is the uh, crime scene uh, investigator certification. It's really targeted at uh, someone for coming in that was fairly new to the uh, profession. Uh, then we have the crime scene analyst certification. 
Um, and this is for someone who has uh, some more experience and uh, some uh, advanced training. And uh, finally, from the general crime scene, we have the uh, certified senior crime scene analyst certification. And this is somebody who has, um, uh, it's a minimum of six years uh, experience in order to take this, but someone who by the time they reach this level is a uh, very well experienced um, uh, crime scene uh, investigator. Uh, we also have another certification within this particular program, uh, which is the crime scene reconstructionist program. And these aren't necessarily people who um, go out and collect evidence at the, uh, the crime scenes, but usually they work with uh, the products provided by uh, other investigators that have been out to uh, crime scenes, and they uh, try and reconstruct what happened using uh, various different types of um, uh, examinations, things like bloodstain pattern analysis, um, uh, shooting reconstructions, and so on, so that we can get a better idea of what actually happened at a, at a crime scene. Now, a lot of the crime scene investigators or people who are analysts and, and certified as such don't work in laboratories. Uh, the, the traditional forensic science laboratory, right. is that correct? That's correct. Most of them are working in specialized units, mm -hmm. which are usually affiliated with a law enforcement agency. Right. But Laurel, let me jump ahead to you for a second. Um, there are some laboratories that do have crime scene units, isn't that correct? That's correct. All right. so do you require as part of accreditation that people in the crime scene unit or these other disciplines that Bob is explaining, that the analysts become certified in those disciplines? Um, we have no accreditation requirement that speaks specifically to a requirement for certification. An organization needs to ensure the competence of the folks that are performing mm -hmm. the, the testing work. And certainly part of their training program may um, end with seeking and obtaining and maintaining certification. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that would, at this time, that's up to the forensic service provider to determine if that is appropriate or necessary for a particular discipline. Right. Does accreditation have any basic educational requirements to be an analyst in an accredited lab, like a Bachelor of Science or a Master's of Science or so forth? So um, our foundational international standard that we use, ISO IEC 17025 that's used for testing laboratories does not. It does not have any um, stated educational requirements and I'm sure you can understand why because it is an international standard. It's used in every sector of testing that is performed globally. Um, so it would be impossible, right, to determine what the educational requirements would be for everyone that would mm -hmm. use that document. A and a B forensics in our accreditation requirements does have some educational requirements for those folks that issue test reports or calibration certificates. And whether there is an educational requirement does differ by discipline, Ken. Mm -hmm. There are some disciplines where the minimum education requirement is a, at least a baccalaureate, a minimum of a baccalaureate degree in a chemical, a physical, or biological natural science. Uh, some disciplines, it's, it's meeting the job description of the forensic service provider. And then we do have some disciplines that require an advanced degree. Um, accreditation in disciplines of anthropology, disaster victim identification is newer for a and AB forensics, but those require the advanced medical degrees. Okay, well thank you. So really certification adds to the educational background of the analysts because they're getting more training and testing and so forth. Yes, it does. It adds both to the educational as well as the development of skills that are necessary in order to do the, uh, the sort of analyses that's required of them. Good, thank you. Our next program is the Forensic Artist Program. And these are the folks that do things like the uh, composite images of a uh, potential suspect uh, based upon description and information given to them by, um, by a, uh, a victim or a witness or what have you. Uh, but also this has sort of three different areas where someone can specialize can specialize in. Uh, one deals with um, the basic composite type drawing. Uh, the other one deals with the uh, a reconstruction of, uh, of a face when you just have something like a skull uh, that's been recovered from a crime scene. 
And then the other one deals with um, age progression, uh, which is used uh, very often when uh, young children are, uh, are abducted or kidnapped and then they um, go missing for a certain number of years and you need an idea of uh, what that person may look like uh, 10 years hence. Um, this is the type of uh, training and skill that these folks have. And it also uh, works for suspects too, where somebody may commit a crime when they're 35 years old and 20 years later, you want to go looking for them and you want to get an idea of just how they may have aged and what they may look like today. Okay. Then we have the blood stain pattern analyst. Um, and these are the folks that based upon the um, particular type of blood stain patterns that may be found at a crime scene um, through their studies and through their training uh, can uh, give you a pretty good idea of possibly that the type of action that took place uh, there at the crime scene, maybe the type of weapon that was used, uh, whether or not this blood spatter is, in, is indicative of a, uh, a bludgeoning type of a, a weapon or whether it's the result of a gunshot uh, and so on. Uh, they can also look at uh, certain types of blood stains and uh, determine just, um, uh, you know, ideas about directionality. Did it come from this particular area or that particular area? And many times uh, it can be used to uh, refute a particular scenario that's being offered by a suspect. Then we have our footwear examiners, and these are the folks that uh, look at the uh, outer sole characteristics of uh, shoes and compare them to uh, footprints and uh, footwear impressions that are found at, uh, at crime scenes. So let me ask you about the footwear examination. As you know, there was a recent report uh, issued at the end of 2016 which criticized footwear and tire track impression uh, comparisons. Uh, but certification of these individuals who do these analyses really add to the professionalism and proficiency of what they do. So despite that criticism, your certification program make sure that these analysts are applying the analytical process that is applicable in an appropriate way when they do their analysis. That's correct, and it ensures that they are following the standards that have already been developed for their uh, particular discipline. Um, and it, it also makes sure that uh, you know, they, they follow the, uh, use the correct terminology, that they're uh, writing their reports in a proper way, that their conclusions are um, uh, formulated in a certain way so that uh, uh, you can have a clear understanding of uh, just how much association there is between a particular footprint and a uh, particular uh, piece of uh, uh, footwear. Thank you. Now we also have a certification program for uh, forensic photography and imaging and uh, these folks uh, not only have uh, training and experience in uh, taking photographs at, uh, uh, at crime scenes and photographs of evidence, uh, but they also um, know how to look at images, and especially these days in, uh, in the digital world, of uh, dealing with uh, specific types of enhancements. Um, they can go looking for information within images as well as telling you whether or not an image has been uh, somehow doctored or altered or what have you through part of their, uh, their analysis. Our 10 print certification also deals with fingerprints, but um, this is somewhat different from the um, uh, latent print certification. Uh, these are the folks that deal with the uh, actual fingerprint records um, that are supplied to various agencies uh, when someone gets arrested and so on. And uh, their expertise is in making sure that those records are correct, making sure that uh, uh, fingerprint records that come in are compared to existing records so they know that they're talking about the same person or a different person. And these are also people that uh, are very uh, uh, expert in, their, um, in the use of the uh, automated fingerprint identification systems. So the defense attorneys and prosecutors shouldn't be confused with someone who gets up and says, I've been certified in 10 print analysis because those individuals are not necessarily trained in the latent print comparison with a known standard. That's correct. That they're, they're usually comparing standards to standards. Right. Thank you. 
Now we also have a certification program for forensic video, uh, and they demonstrate knowledge and abilities related to the examination, comparison, or the evaluation of video in legal matters. Um, they demonstrate a knowledge of relevant video and image science concepts and technologies, understanding and adherence to discipline accepted methods uh, in the collection, preservation, and processing of multimedia evidence, and the ongoing development of skills, knowledge, and abilities related to video analysis discipline uh, through continuing education. Now, I had a question earlier about complaints. And generally, we have complaints that, that fall into two categories. Um, they are violations of conduct or ethical standards or technical errors. They're formally processed and evaluated by uh, a professional review board. And the, the people who staff the professional review board come from uh, my group, the uh, Forensic Certification Management Board, which consists of all of our certification boards. Each of the boards has about seven people on them. Uh, so we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of people to draw from. If the complaint is sustained by the review board, it can result in a private reprimand, a public written reprimand, suspension or revocation of the certification. All right, so when you do reprimand somebody, you indicated that there was a uh, public recommend, uh, reprimand. How is that published? How would the, the, the normal public defender or prosecutor in some state like Oklahoma or, or Virginia know or find out that a particular analyst has been uh, reprimanded in preparation for trial. The IEI publishes <clears throat> both the Journal of Forensic Identification and the um, a publication known as ID News or Identification News. And uh, that comes out about four times a year. And uh, discipline procedures like this, when we have results that um, sustain a, a particular uh, complaint, uh, the results will get published in those. So, but you have to join IEI in order to get the journal, do you, or you have to pay for it. It's not a free access online. That's correct, but we're also open to any inquiries. If somebody wants to find out whether somebody has been uh, suspended or whatever, they only need to call the office and we will supply them with that information. Right. So that would be a good thing for any prosecutor or defense attorney to do uh, prior to trial when there is an examiner who's going to be testified and whose CV indicates they're certified by IAIs for them to call and, and just check to see whether or not there has been any disciplinary action. Yeah, it's important even if it's not an, an IAI certification. If someone is claiming certification, uh, it's important to uh, realize that the certifications have to be renewed periodically. And some people may claim that they were certified at one time, uh, but they're not currently certified. And so it's okay. important to make sure that they are current uh, with regard to that. Because you don't know, in some instances with regard to complaints, there may not be a formal hearing uh, conducted for it because the person will voluntarily surrender their, um, uh, their certification. And if that's the mm -hmm. case, then there's no process of adjudication of the facts uh, with regard to uh, what was around that, uh, that particular complaint. So you may not find something that's, that's published. But we also have, uh, on our website, we maintain uh, current lists of all the people that are uh, certified. And that's, you don't have to be a member of the II for that. You can, any member of the public can go on the certification section and find that information there. And what's the website? I'll get to that and okay. uh, show all you right. one of the other uh, slides All right, here. but before we go there, so if I call about, you know, John Doe, who's uh, certified in footwear impressions, and he had a complaint lodged against him, but he surrendered his uh, certification. Will you tell us that, he, that there had been something pending when he uh, surrendered his certification? Well, we won't tell you specifics about it, but we will tell you that he's no longer certified. But not that he surrendered it because of a complaint. That's correct. Now, if you want that kind of information, be because of the uh, confidentiality requirements with uh, regard to accreditation. If you want that kind of information, you have to supply a subpoena. And then we have to notify that individual that we have been served with a subpoena and we are supplying uh, the specific level of information that, uh, that's being requested. And do you recognize out-of-state subpoenas uh, without going through the 
interstate compact and out-of-state subpoenas? Oh, yeah, and anything that comes from any state, as long as it's uh, uh, filed with our home office, we'll, uh, we'll recognize it. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, give you an idea of the um, the fee structure. There is a cost involved uh, with this, but it covers the entire five-year certification period. Um, for II members, the um, the fee is three hundred dollars, and for non-II members, uh, the fee is uh, four hundred dollars. All right. Do you give any type of scholarship for these um, individuals who may not be able to afford the three hundred dollars, or any tuition break for? <laughs> Let's say five people from a single lab want to get certified. Do they get any tuition break? No, it's all the same like price. It's all the same price? Based on the individual. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> How long does the certification <clears throat> take from start to completion? It, it, it depends, depends on, on, on the particular discipline. Some of the certifications are set up so that you take a written test, and then if you pass the written test, you're allowed to proceed to other portions of the mm -hmm. testing process. All right. Uh, others, you just sit down in one setting and you take the whole test at one time. Right? With uh, things like footwear, um, you pass, if you pass your, your written test first, then they will send you out the practical aspects of the test that you can take. They do the same thing in forensic photography. Um, but if you're taking a crime scene test, it's, a, it's all a written test. It's one sitting, you sit down and you take the entire test all at once. Same thing with um, latent prints. If you want to take the uh, latent print certification test, there'll be a written portion uh, and a skill set um, that are all tested, but within the same time block, uh, so that those two aren't aren't separated like that. Do you get any sense from the um, the forensic science service providers that there's pushback on getting their analysts certified because the time it takes them off the bench? or the cost of the program if they were going to pay for it? We, we never really had, had any complaints with regard to the cost because it's, it's not that much money covering a five-year period. Um, usually there, there are um, concerns on the person who is becoming certified as to whether or not their employer is going to reimburse them for that. Um, but generally, we don't get a lot of complaints as far as the, the actual cost is concerned. There are other costs associated with uh, certification, and that is obviously the, the cost of your training uh, that you have to have and the cost of the study material uh, that you have to buy in order to uh, prepare to take uh, you know, the written portion of the, uh, of the examination. So when you say the cost of the training, the $300 for an initial certification by an IAI member only gets you in the door, you then have to pay for the well, you, you course would materials. You would have well your training, training before you actually applied. Or are you talking about their basic training I'm in the laboratory? Well, I'm talking about their, their training in that particular discipline right. okay. that they have to have in place before they can even apply for certification. Okay, and is that training separate than what they would normally get during their uh, two-year probation period or training period in the laboratory? Well, it's going to be spe uh, discipline-specific yes, training, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the stuff that they get from the laboratory, as long as the, um, if it's training that's being provided by the laboratory, they can apply to the individual certification board to see whether or not they will accept that training as part of their uh, pre-certification requirement. Yeah. All right, uh, but generally there are um, independent instructors out there that are providing training in uh, discipline-specific areas uh, that people will attend. Sometimes it's a one-week course, a two-week course, or something like that. All right, so the certification process or the pre-certification requirements does take the person off the bench for a while. If they for a certain amount of time, week, sure. They're one week they're not doing cases in the, in the laboratory. Of course, a lot depends on the hiring practices of the particular agency. So an agency may hire somebody into a particular slot and bring them in as a trainee, and obviously that's going to take a lot of time to train that person up, mm -hmm. to, up to competence. Uh, or they may be looking for somebody who's already qualified in that area. And if you hire somebody like that, then there's obviously you don't have to uh, repeat all that training. Right. Good. All right. Now, there are other certifying bodies out there. Um, organizations like the American Board of Criminalistics and uh, for Firearms, the Association of Firearm Tumark Examiners. 
uh, for uh, medical examiners, the American Board of uh, Pathology, um, for the uh, uh, forensic dentists, we have the American Board of Forensic Odontology. There's the National Association of Forensic Counselors, the American Board of Forensic Anthropology, American Board of Forensic Document Examiners, Medical Legal Death Investigators, uh, Forensic Toxicology, and as well as the um, Forensic Engineers. Now, as far as accreditation goes, the um, II has, has been uh, previously accredited through the uh, uh, Forensic Specialties Accreditation Board. Uh, however, we have um, uh, the, the work of the uh, FSAB, F FSAB, uh, is not recognized internationally, and we have um, a number of divisions. Um, we have 15, actually, uh, divisions internationally. We, uh, not that long ago, opened up a division in the, uh, the Euro Division uh, in the uh, European Union, and uh, they recognize ISO, and so we really can't maintain accreditations in, in, uh, in both areas. Uh, accreditation can be very expensive. Um, and so we decided to, uh, to move over to the 17024 uh, accreditation, which <clears throat> seems to fit our needs uh, better. Mm -hmm. We've been in preparation uh, for that for about a year and a half now, and we intend to uh, file our uh, application for accreditation in uh, early uh, 2018. Again, if you need more information about IEI, uh, uh, the IEI itself, or IEI certification programs, our website is uh, www.theiai.org. And when you get there, you can go to the certification page, and uh, you'll see that there are specific areas for all of the uh, certification programs. And if you click on any one of these, it'll take you to an area that'll let you know who exactly is certified. And it doesn't just tell you who is certified, it also tells you when their certifications expire. Mm -hmm. So you know if somebody's coming up re for a, uh, a recent or has recently missed uh, you know, their uh, recertification requirements. Right. So the, the courts and the federal rules focus in part on the application of the analytical process, as I said earlier, to the particular case at hand. Um, and sometimes the Daubert hearings, referred to by some jurisdiction as Kum Ho hearings, mm -hmm. focus directly on whether the analyst applied the process appropriately. So it seems to me that your certification programs and the other certification programs that you listed there go far toward uh, giving the public confidence that the individual an analyst will have the knowledge and competency to apply these protocols appropriately. Yes, and mo most of the uh, written portions of the examinations cover, the, cover those uh, kind of specifics that you just brought mm -hmm. up. Good. So I see we have no uh, chat questions now. Uh, please, if you do have any questions for Bob and the certification, still post them and we can uh, discuss those more toward the end of the uh, program, and if not, answer those on the Q&A document that you will receive in email. So now let's turn to accreditation, because accreditation is also extremely important. Uh, Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals uh, case, the Dalbert case, uh, gave five factors that should be uh, looked at with regard to um, the admissibility of forensic science evidence. Thank you. Uh, and two of those were one were the existence and maintenance of standards and protocols, and another was the error rate. And I think as we go through our discussion on accreditation, the accreditation gives a quality management system, I believe, that helps reduce mistakes in the lab, uh, helps increase uh, the accuracy of the laboratory because of the requirements of accreditation and so forth. So, Laurel, let me turn it over to you and let's discuss accreditation of forensic science service providers. Okay. Thank you, Ken. All right. So, just briefly, we'll look at the following topics here today. We're going to talk about what accreditation is and what it is not, because it's important for everyone to understand um, the goal of accreditation and, and what we can and cannot do with this tool. 
Uh, we'll take a brief look at the history of accreditation of forensic service providers here in the United States, both by ANAB and ASCLAD Lab, and we'll explain the relationship between these two accrediting bodies that are now one. Uh, we'll also look at some current statistics just to get an idea of how many forensic service providers have, have gone through this process and are maintaining accreditation today. Then we'll actually look at the standard that itself that's primarily used for the accreditation of laboratories and that is ISO IEC 17025. Its title is the General Requirements for the Competence of Testing and Calibration Laboratories. That plays right into the next bullet because ANAB, as an accrediting body, has um, a responsibility to evaluate if, in fact, sector-specific requirements are needed in addition to these general requirements. And, in fact, that is the case. So we will look at the ANAB forensic specific requirements uh, for testing laboratories in our merged accreditation program. And then we'll talk just briefly about how ANAB assessment activities can also incorporate other accreditation requirements such as the FBI quality assurance standards for DNA databasing or testing laboratories or potentially the American Board of Forensic Toxicologists uh, checklist for accreditation. And then lastly, we'll kind of try and wrap this all up and again, just talk about accreditation in a, a, as a tool uh, for just what you said, Ken, to help build a, the foundation of a strong organization. So the best place to begin when we want to talk about what accreditation is and is not is with the definition. And this definition also comes, it's adapted from an ISO standard. The citation is there for you. But the definition of accreditation is a third party attestation related to a forensic service provider conveying formal demonstration of its competence to carry out specific tasks. So there's some similarity there to what Bob presented regarding certification because of those first two words, third party. Um, so it's an independent evaluation of this forensic service provider. It's an evaluation of their conformance with the agreed upon requirements. It's an evaluation of the competence of the personnel to perform the types of testing or calibration for which they are seeking accreditation. And then it's a general overall evaluation of the effectiveness of the organization. So what accreditation is not is a, a review of every record produced by a forensic service provider over a period of time. Assessment activities employ sampling. Um, the sampling needs to be sufficient to meet those goals that I talked about prior, that we can in fact determine conformance with the requirements, that we can evaluate competence of personnel, but there is, there's just no way that we can review every record produced by um, a laboratory. And it is not personal certification. Um, and it's also not certification of an individual test result. And um, we get asked that question quite frequently, but that is not the purpose of accreditation. So let's uh, talk about history a little bit. And, and the main purpose for doing so is to show really the lengthy history of accreditation of forensic service providers um, in the U.S. and internationally. And the accreditation of forensic service providers in the United States really grew out of a homegrown initiative by ASCLAD, the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors, who in the 70s took the initiative to look at the performance of their laboratories and evaluate different tools that could be used to improve the quality of the work that was being provided. And the two that rose to the top of that list were personal certification, Bob, and laboratory accreditation. And so ASCLAD took the initiative to really develop the initial accreditation program. And the first crime laboratory was accredited in 1982. That ASCLAD lab accreditation program continued. Um, it was more of a community voice-based program. All of the lab directors had 
had um, involvement and, and say in the accreditation requirements that were used. And then in 2004, ASCLAD Lab made the move to um, begin the, a program of accredited accreditation based on an international standard. So accreditation with ISO IEC 17025 as the foundation began to be provided for testing laboratories and for forensic service providers performing calibration of breath alcohol measuring instruments or manufacturing and certifying ethanol and water solutions that were used for the calibration of those instruments. Uh, the, what is now referred to as the legacy program of ASCLAD Lab certainly continued during this transition. It was a lengthy transition for these laboratories to move to the ISO IEC 17025 based programs. <laughs> In fact, the last uh, laboratory was accredited to the ASCLAD Lab legacy program as recently as 2016. So going back to the, this earlier slide, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. to, That's fine. But I had a, a question or two on that. Why is it important to go to an international standard? What was wrong with the legacy program and mm -hmm. the accreditation uh, requirements or your supplemental accreditation requirements in that program? Um, well, nothing was wrong. It was just that process of continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the highest paid compliments you could get was given to ASCLAD Lab when basically the ASCLAD Lab legacy accreditation manual was used as the foundation for a guidance document at the international level. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want people to think that the move was because anything was wrong, uh, but ISO certainly was growing over this time and 17025, we'll look at the history of that, was now a standard. and. And there is value in basing an accreditation program on an international standard. Certainly, um, forensic laboratories do a unique type of work, but the basic tenets of an effective and efficient organization are not unique to forensic science. So moving to this foundational document that was tried and true and used in many different sectors of business um, was appropriate to do. It was, it's also appropriate to do for a couple other reasons, um, and certainly in today's day and age, sometimes crime does not stay within a single continent. Mm -hmm. And so by having accreditation of forensic service providers internationally based on the same standard allows for results to um, be accepted in, in other courts of law in other countries if that becomes important as cases are developed. And then I think the other thing that comes to mind is by um, ASCLAD Lab moving to the use of an international standard, it provided us a mechanism to be evaluated um, because we then had the opportunity to request and go through the process of recognition, which means we periodically have a team of experts in evaluating how well we perform as an accrediting body. And that's important for us to grow and continue to improve, but it's important for those that rely on accreditation services um, to know that it's just not ASCLAD Lab or a and &E doing their own thing, mm -hmm. that, that we too get evaluated. Um, well, that's great. And, and in fact, ASCLAD Lab, as well as now ANAB Forensics, do accredit laboratories in other countries? Um, that is correct. Uh, we currently have laboratories accredited in nine other countries, and and that is a an area of our accredited lab population that we'll look at here shortly. That's that's growing rapidly, and um, to our government's credit, a lot of that growth is due to some initiatives by Department of Justice to help raise. Um, raise the quality of forensic work that is done in other countries to help prepare those laboratories for accreditation and get them through that process. So I've been on, I was on the ASCLAD Lab accreditation board for um, over a decade. Years. Years and years. <laughs> and so I saw the transition from the very beginning where it was volunteers, everybody, even the director was volunteers. 
and how it matured over the ages, but more importantly, how laboratories, uh, forensic service providers around the country began to accept outside mm -hmm. review of their procedures and quality management system. And now, uh, I think you told me last night that 98% of the laboratories that are accredited are accredited by, accredited by I don't know which to call you now, Ask Lad Lab or ANAB <laughs> Forensics, but the, the program that you were involved in. Um, that, that statistic is close, 96, 98%. We certainly do have the large market share in all. Um, we'll talk about our statistics here yeah. in a minute. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 a growing, it's a growing field. You are correct that it's still really a grassroots uh, growth. Uh, there are a number of states that require accreditation, but it's still a small percentage. So most of the laboratories that are accredited are doing so voluntarily. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting to work with labs over a period of time and, and see them just really embrace the, the culture change and the, the concept of, of continuous improvement. And, and, and they do welcome, as you say, they, they actually they welcome and they want mm -hmm. the independent review of what they're doing because if there's something that they can do better um, or something that they are not doing properly, they, they want help in identifying that. Yeah. So it's very so, encouraging. <clears throat> while it's primarily voluntary, there are a couple states that require accreditation, but the important point is it was the laboratories that asked for yes. an accreditation program, the laboratories yeah. itself. Yeah. Asked for the accreditation yes. program. Yes, you you are correct. It was it was the laboratory directors that that did um, evaluate their current level of performance, decide that they mm -hmm. could make improvements, and evaluated a number of options, and really decided that accreditation and and uh, personal certification were the two that were going to give them the biggest bang for the buck, mm -hmm. that was going to provide the the highest return. Good. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. All right, let's look at the history of ANAB and talk a little bit about the merger of the two companies. So um, ANSI ASQ National Accreditation Board was founded in 1989 as a joint effort between ANSI, which stands for American National Standards Institute, which was founded itself in 1918, and then ASQ, which is the American um, Society for Quality that was founded in 1946. And when ANAB began, their focus was on the accreditation of management systems. It then expanded to accreditation of non-forensic laboratories. And then with the acquisition of Forensic Quality Services in 2011, ANAB began to offer accreditation to forensic service providers. And you can see there by the information on the slide that FQS was progressive in the accreditation services that they were providing because they too had moved to accreditation based on ISO IEC 17025. So the bigger change happened in April of 2016 when ANAB and ASCLAD Lab decided to quit competing and merge. Um, to provide accreditation services to the forensic community, uh, which, which resulted in a slight organizational change there. You can see for ANAB acknowledging now um, the, the high number of accreditations that are performed by forensics. Well, you indicated that you wanted to stop competing with each other. Isn't competition good in our society? And what benefits are there for merging with ANAB? Um, I haven't been through any other mergers. I've been through some company reorganizations over my long career. I'm, I'm old enough to have been through a number of those. Um, and, and it was uh, very interesting to watch this develop and be part of this and to see, see the reasons why the merger really was done. And it, these two companies truly did decide to stop competing. They felt that for the forensic science community, it would be a benefit to have really one program or one set of requirements that they were all accredited to. Um, so, so that was one of the primary reasons that both companies wanted to move forward for this. Because, because you had the ANAB 
uh, accreditation requirements and you had the ASCLAD lab supplemental requirements, right. which may not have been the same. So now across the country, to the extent that um, uh, the labs are accredited by ANAB forensics, they all will be doing things under the same accreditation program, which gives uniformity around the country. And that's true. And and I think you'll see even more harmonization within the ANAB forensic programs as we move forward. The merger is still pretty new, and our focus mm -hmm. was on the largest um, sector of laboratories that we accredit those accredited for testing. And you know we're going to continue to harmonize for all of our forensic service programs for just that reason. Mm -hmm. Um, especially on the forensic-specific requirements. Good, thank you. So currently, ANAB Forensics is running nine different accreditation programs, and I'll just uh, say that here is the complete list for you, but the information is now split out on the following three slides. So if we look first at the calibration accreditations that we provide, as I mentioned before, our focus is a very small niche in the world of calibration. And we provide accreditation under the forensics business unit for those that calibrate breath alcohol measuring instruments. And we still have some laboratories that are accredited under the ASCLAD lab program that manufacture reference materials that are used in this calibration process. They actually need to transition to um, uh, an ISO standard, ISO 17034, that was recently published. So they actually will move to being accredited by NAB lab-related division here over the next year or so. But you can see in bold on the slide the, the name of the MERGE program, NAB Forensic Science Calibration Laboratories and their accreditation requirements. Uh, all of our labs that do this work will be transitioning to that accreditation program. So the bulk of the uh, laboratories accredited by ANAB Forensics do perform testing. And you can see here on the slide the reference to the ASCLAD lab program and the ANAB legacy program that were available at the time of the merger. Those programs are still being maintained, but they are due to sunset at the end of December in 2018. The um, merged ANAB Forensic Science Testing Laboratories accreditation requirements were published June 1st of 2017, and we have everybody working to transition to those. At the time that those were de developed, we felt that we needed to acknowledge the growing market internationally, and yet also acknowledge that in many other countries, some requirements that we have here in the United States just are not practical. They, they're just impossible to do, or they may have different educational standards, um, different proficiency testing, accessibility, those kinds of things. So we decided to set up a separate program where we could allow the requirements to diverge on, on certain topics if they needed to. And lastly, we do have some uh, forensic service providers, primarily crime scene units that Bob referred to that are located in in police agencies um, that are accredited based on a, another international standard that we're not going to focus on today during this webinar, and we are maintaining those programs also. So here are some current statistics, and if I orient you to this slide, the first thing to notice is all of the slices of the pie that are pink or red some shade of red. Those are the laboratories that are accredited to one of our testing accreditation programs. Um, you can see that inspection is there in, in the green colors and that we have um, calibration in the blue. Uh, we have 341 organizations that hold an ANAB forensics accreditation, but that's a total of 627 different locations that provide forensic services. We have 265 organizations that only provide services from one physical location, and then we have, I think if I do the math, what is that, 76, that are multi-site. And they are multi-site and could range from providing services at two locations all the way up to 21 different locations. Another way to slice and dice the statistics is to look at the type of organization that is currently accredited. 
And you very quickly can see from this slide that the um, dominating uh, feature here is that uh, it's their government laboratories, government at federal, state, or local level that have primarily gone through the accreditation process, although a 9% uh, piece of the pie there for private corporations is, is significant and to their credit again because no one would be mandating that they be accredited. All right, so before you move on, let me ask you a, a question about uh, some of the accreditations. Uh, I was on a recent uh, committee in which uh, we were discussing the ability of one or two person private laboratories to become mm -hmm. accredited by, uh, by ANAB Forensics. I almost said ask that lab again. That's okay. Um, and their argument was, well, it costs us a lot of money one, number two, we don't have third parties to do verification or technical reviews. Mm -hmm. And four, or three, there, there is just um, too much uh, management requirements for a single person or a two person laboratory. Mm -hmm. how, how do you respond to them and how can we get them accredited? Okay, so we absolutely have accredited small laboratories, um, small government laboratories. We have, we have a number of government laboratories that only have two uh, full-time staff. So mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a government versus private situation that has to be overcome. Mm -hmm. And they, they absolutely can overcome it. There would be a number of accredited laboratories that would probably tell these one or two person labs that writing their management system is gonna be a heck of a lot easier than writing a management system mm. for a lab of 200 or a lab that does work in 21 different locations because it's pretty easy to write down what you do, say you do, and, and make sure the people are following it if there's only one or two people that have to follow it. So mm. some people would tell them that they've got an easier road to go. Um, regarding aspects that we have yet to talk about, but we'll talk about a little bit, such as verification, which is ensuring the validity of a test result by actually re-performing um, the comparison, or technical review, which is an evaluation of the technical records in the report to ensure conformance with procedures and processes and also for su sufficiency. Um, they, they've found ways. They, they tend to partner up either with other smaller labs or with the, um, maybe the state lab in their area. Um, the forensic service provider community is extremely supportive of helping to provide resources, usually free of charge, for those types of services for small um, laboratories or small forensic service providers that want to become accredited. And all of those types of situations are absolutely okay within ISO IEC 17025 and within our requirements. So um, I don't know that we have too many forensic service providers listening to this, but if we have um, attorneys and I guess more towards the prosecutors that are working with forensic service providers that are not yet accredited and they hear that this is part of their reticence, I would say help, help them to contact us and we will absolutely help them through the process. Well, and it would also apply perhaps to the public defenders or defense attorneys who hire a private um, laboratory to do the work because they don't, may not have access to the public lab in their jurisdiction. So they may be the more likely to have an expert from an unaccredited mm -hmm. laboratory. And the laboratory, for purposes of definition, is that one person, mm -hmm. correct? So, um, you know, both prosecutors and defense attorneys should realize that the excuse that they give is not one that would necessarily hold up under cross-examination. And I'll rephrase that, I'll let you use the word, the <laughs> excuse, and I'll just say that the resources are there and that we're happy to help educate them on the process and how they in fact can accomplish the process successfully, even if they are a one or a two person forensic service provider. Yeah. But on the other hand, just because a laboratory is not accredited, whether it be a larger laboratory or a small one or two person, doesn't mean they're not doing quality work. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I think Bob had a slide similar to this. You know, th anytime um, 
results of testing or inspection or calibration come into um, any legal um, uh, case, they, they need to be put through their paces. I'm a firm believer in that, that, that the quality of the work needs to be evaluated for that individual scenario. And one last point on, on this issue is there are outside resources for labs to, to get kind of go-by manuals and things like that to help them prepare their own accreditation, as well as um, companies that help you prepare for accreditation. Um, that's true. ANAB Forensics will not do that. We right. are prohibited from consulting, so we cannot tell a forensic service provider, if you do X, then you will pass accreditation. Mm -hmm. We cannot do that. But there are certainly consultants out there that are helping laboratories or forensic service providers get prepared for accreditation. Uh, there, are many, there are many training classes available. There are also many accredited forensic service providers that post all of their documents on the web. Mm -hmm. They're very, very transparent. And I would encourage someone who's looking to accreditation certainly to avail of themselves of all of those things, but also to not just assume or not take someone else's um, procedures and policies and just automatically implement them. Mm -hmm. They certainly can use them as a foundation, but they need to make sure that it's right for them, because um, it may not be. Well, so a lot, a lot of the very small labs are in police departments that may be in uh, rural areas, and there may be one or two people. Are, are you seeing an increase in those types of laboratories becoming accredited? And, and if not, how do you, do you have any suggestions on how to uh, give some impetus for those small police department laboratories with maybe a fingerprint analyst and a uh, shoe print analyst to become accredited? Um, we certainly see the number of accredited forensic service providers continuing to grow. So the message and the value is spreading and, and certainly it was the larger state systems that jumped on board early. So a lot of the organic growth is, is more at the county, local level, or private level, mm. smaller, smaller labs. Um, I, I think that support for that does even come from their state laboratories. Again, I think, I think that they help provide support and, and maybe, help, maybe help with some of the push towards accreditation. Certainly, the legal community helps spread the word that, that it's valuable and, and that there's an expectation. Again, a and &E is not a regulator. We cannot mandate accreditation. We, we have, we can provide the service that's, that's needed, but we cannot force anybody to drink the Kool-Aid. That would only come through statute or through, um, through the courts, just really mandating it before, um, or expecting it, I should say, not mandating it, maybe expecting it before the results are admissible. Great. Well, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Oh, dessert. And, and that's right, dessert. It's time to talk about the cake of requirements. Sometimes we call it the cake of quality. And it's just important to understand how this cake is put together before we actually look at some of the um, topics that are covered in ISO IEC 17025 or the ANAB forensic requirements. So the bottom layer of the cake is that international standard, and that is the foundation. And as any accrediting body, and ANAB Forensic specifically adds sector-specific requirements, we cannot take something away from ISO IEC 17025. We can't decide we just don't want to follow that requirement. We can add to it, but we cannot delete. So next on here would be any of those other requirements that we talked about that are out there and available for forensic service providers. Um, we have there at the top of the list the FBI quality assurance standards for DNA databasing or testing laboratories. ANAB Forensics has uh, strategic alliances with both the American Board of Forensic Toxicology and the National Association of Medical Examiners to allow um, a forensic service provider seeking accreditation through our programs to add their requirements to our assessment activities. 
All right, so let me I interrupt you again sure. for <clears throat> just one second. You've mentioned the FBI quality assurance standards for DNA. Those are the standards which were uh, passed or promulgated by SWIGDAM. And those uh, requirements are necessary for a lab to meet if their DNA um, section of the laboratory wants to access the uh, CODIS, Correct. the DNA uh, database. So do they come in with you to do the accreditation or do you accredit to their standards for the FBI? Um, we have a, an, an MOU with the FBI as an accrediting body um, to use uh, auditors that have gone through their required training uh, to evaluate conformance to the QAS requirements. Now, it works out to be very efficient because usually those auditors are also trained technical assessors for us. And it's probably no surprise that the FBI QAS uh, requirements fit nicely into the major topics that we're going to talk about with ISO IEC 17025. So it's, it's the most efficient way to look at all of these requirements. And then um, INDIS uh, also goes in and looks at the laboratories that participate in CODIS and checks um, additional operating rules that they must follow. Mm -hmm. and, and that's outside of our purview. All right, so a lot of what you're saying today involves um, <coughs> real terminology, and you just used two. One was the auditors for the FBI, but your uh, individuals who go in are assessors? Um, the terms are fairly synonymous, and, and, and a lot of people use them. Um, in, they exchange how they're used, or I can use either one. And, and auditor is the term that the QAS program uses, so that's why I referred to them that and way. And the QAS is? The Quality Assurance Standards the from FBI's. the FBI. Um, it, at a and &E we do use the term assessor for the people that staff our assessment teams. And part of that's to continue to send the message that when we come in, it's a third party evaluation. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of times the term audit or auditor is used more for that internal process that an organization might do to ensure that they're in conformance with requirements. Will you be talking about who your assessors are and where you get them and whether they're professional or volunteer and so forth later on? And if not, can we address that now? Because that, that's important for purposes of of uh, the accreditation process. Professor Stars used to call Ask Lad Lab a bunch of golfing buddies because they look at each other's labs. So the assessors now, are they professional and employed by ANA, AB, forensics, or are they still volunteers? And how do we make sure that it's n just not a good old boy network? Okay. Um, now let's address it now because I, okay. don't, I don't have a specific slide to this. So. Assessment teams are structured in the manner that there's a, a lead assessor who is responsible to coordinate the activity and also is the one that's most knowledgeable in the ISO IEC 17025 accreditation requirements as well as the ANAB forensic requirements. But they're, they're, they're the expert on the team on those. Mm -hmm. and, and we staff the assessment team with one or more technical assessors based on the scope of accreditation that the forensic service provider is asking us to review. And they choose what they want to be accredited in. So they might do crime scene, but they might choose not to include that within their scope of accreditation. So based on what they want us to look at, then we set up the assessment team appropriately and determine the duration of time that we're gonna be on site. The technical assessors have to have worked independently in the discipline that they are going to accredit and and more importantly have worked with the technology that the laboratory is going to use to do their testing um, so that we have a high level of confidence that they can evaluate the competence of that forensic service provider to do the work that we that they want listed on their scope of accreditation when we're done so uh, I thought back when I was on the board that <coughs> if a laboratory wanted to be accredited, you had to accredit each of the disciplines 
that it had. Is there an exception for crime scene, or is that not still the requirement? Um, times have changed, Ken. Um, I know it. So no, more than uh, anybody. <laughs> um, and you are correct. When Asclad Lab began providing accreditation services, um, it it pretty much was an all. Um, or none, although they made some exceptions if we needed to get DNA accredited first and then add the other disciplines. And when crime scene came on and when calibration of breath alcohol measurement instruments came on, those were maintained as optional. But other than that, um, through those programs at that time, the forensic service provider could not pick and choose to say accredit uh, friction ridge but not accredit firearms or to accredit drug chemistry and toxicology, but not to accredit trace. They couldn't make that choice. Um, even before the merger, Asclad Lab had moved away from that business model and, and had opened it up to allowing the consumer to choose uh, what they wanted to seek accreditation in. Um, and part of that, again, comes, you know, we're not a regulator. Um, our, our, our purpose is to provide the, the programs that are necessary and then for the consumer to choose what, what's appropriate for them. So that, that's, I think, an important point now. I mean, before you would ask the witness on the stand, is your laboratory accredited? Mm -hmm. And they'd say yes, and we would assume that it was accredited in this discipline. Now the question to the expert has to be more precise is the lab accredited in the discipline about which you're testifying. Does that sound correct? Yes, and, and so everyone understands that when the assessment process is complete and the accreditation decision is granted, uh, both a certificate and a scope of accreditation are issued. And the scope will clearly list the, the disciplines for which accreditation has been granted. And uh, moving forward, the scopes will have additional information and more specific information about the types of testing mm -hmm. that um, are, were evaluated within each discipline. So uh, anyone interested can find current scopes of accreditation on the anab.org website. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry. Let's go no. back to the cake. You're fine, yes. Um, let's talk, talk just about the top layer of that cake. Uh, which is in fact the forensic service providers management system that they put in place uh, to implement all of the accreditation requirements and they are responsible for considering any applicable state and local laws and as we move forward with the OSAC initiative certainly one of the uh, fastest ways to implement any standards that might make it to the registry of standards there is for a forensic service provider to take those standards and implement them into their management system. Well, since the OSAC standards, I mean, they propose standards, they go through an SDO, a standards development organization, come back to OSAC, and then they're put on their registry. After that, community input and general acceptance of those standards, why doesn't ANAB forensics require the laboratories that are accredited to use those standards? Um, you're giving us more power than we have. Um, well, we, please we, take it. <laughs> <laughs> we, again, we're not, we're not regulators. Um, we're not what is often in our area of the world called a scheme owner, uh, you know, with authority to mandate that. Mm -hmm. uh, as the OSAC initiative continues to develop and mature, uh, if, if, there is a, is, if there is a request to, you know, offer an accreditation program that includes every single OSAC standard. Uh, ANAB, I'm sure, will entertain that. But I don't know that that would be the only choice of accreditation for forensic service providers that we would offer, mm -hmm. um, at least not without, without a scheme owner, without some sort of mandate uh, that that be what the program be designed to be. Um, uh, we'll just have to wait and see how this develops. Right. Um, it, it's a, a growth process. But so when your assessors go in now, how do they determine that the best practices or the guidelines or standards that an individual laboratory requires their analysts to follow are generally accepted or good 
uh, laboratory processes and protocols? Um, that's a great question. You, you ask good questions. Um, ISO IEC 17025, as it talks about test methods or calibrations, mm -hmm. uses a very general generic word, appropriate. Okay, which, which does leave a lot of room for interpretation. And the way accreditation works now is, is again, by the use of those technical assessors that um, are professionals, they are working in the field, they have experience in the field, they know what the expectation is, um, and, and for them to raise a concern if, in fact, they feel that the appropriate that the test methods being used by a laboratory would not be appropriate. Um, I, as you mentioned, I participate in the OSAC process, not wearing an ANAB hat, but wearing a Society of Forensic Toxicologists hat. But I see a lot of benefit coming um, with the standards going on the registry to again add that detail as to, and clearly add the detail as how appropriate should be defined. Right now, it's a little bit more nebulous. Mm -hmm. And it is based on the, the work of the SWIGs that Bob referred to earlier, or um, information from the different professional organizations in the different disciplines, such as AFTI, IAI, uh, et cetera. So it doesn't, it doesn't concern me. I don't want you to get that from anything I'm saying, but I do see moving forward uh, that we're gonna have a lot more to define those general words that are in 17025. Okay, great. So before we leave the cake, let me um, just remind the audience that you can use the chat function and ask questions of Laurel or Bob or me uh, just by using that function and we'll uh, try to address them as they come up. So please don't forget that function. Thank you. Laurel? All right. So uh, a couple of slides just briefly here on ISO. Uh, ISO is the International Organization for Standardization. And again, the standards that are used by ANAB Forensics or even ANAB as a whole are a very small slice of the pie, but ISO has been around for a long time with a mission really to help uh, promote the development of standardization and to fil facilitate international trade and commerce. And forensics, of course, fits into that big mission. Um, ISO today has over 22,000 standards for many, many sectors. So it's important to just talk about and, again, be on the same page with what a standard is. A standard does provide the requirements or specifications that you are going to use to evaluate a product, a process, a service and to make sure that they're fit for their purpose. And you'll hear that phrase at different times when you start talking with people that work in the accreditation or the assessment, the assessment sector, that things are to be fit for their purpose. So we're going to take a, a walk through ISO IEC 17025 very briefly just to acquaint you with the sections that are in there. But I wanted to stop for just a minute here and again impress upon the audience that this is not new. It may be relatively new for forensic science, but um, ISO IEC 17025 started out at a, as a guide back in 1990 and has its history there. And we'll talk about at the end that literally just in the last week or two, we have a new version of the standard that's been published that we will have to transition all of our laboratories mm -hmm. and forensic service providers to. So if you look at this standard document, you will see that it's organized into five different sections. And I'm not going to spend any time today on sections one through three. I certainly include uh, or encourage the audience to obtain a copy of it and to read the document and to refer to the document as they are working on forensic cases or forensic issues. But we're going to walk through sections four and, and section five. So all of the following slides are laid out in the same way where I have the number and the name of the section there on the left. And then I've provided you Laurel's interpretation of what the sections basically cover. And if applicable, I have information there regarding um, additional requirements from the ANAB forensic specific accreditation requirements. So you can see these initial sections of uh, subsections of the management requirements for 17025 or just what you would expect. 
that the organization has to outline its scope of work. Uh, these requirements deal with the impartiality of the work, the confidentiality of the work, and the appropriate resources to do the work. We've already talked about the guiding principles of professional responsibility, so I'm not going to spend any more time on it other than to, again, just acknowledge that that is a forensic-specific requirement. And then Section 4.3, Document Control in 17025, really provides the structure and the instructions for all of the staff to perform their work. It's management saying we want you to follow this procedure and only this procedure to do a friction ridge comparison. I may have meant to ask this question later in the program, but with respect to your uh, guiding principles of professional responsibility, every laboratory uh, that is accredited has to um, abide by these principles. The requirement in the accreditation requirements is to use either the document that ANAB has provided or an equivalent. Um, because certainly it was time for us to acknowledge that over the last however many years since ASCLAP Lab originally brought that document on, many forensic service providers and organizations have developed their own code of professional responsibility. Mm -hmm. And, and if they're equivalent, then it's fine. If they want their folks only reading theirs, that would certainly be acceptable. But, but there's the requirement to have something. There's the requirement to review it with staff. And there's a requirement to have a mechanism to take appropriate action when it's necessary. All right. So they're required to have some sort of enforcement mechanism on the code of professional responsibility. Correct. And, of course, we all remember that the National Commission of Forensic Science has... Uh, introduced its own code mm -hmm. and the Department of Justice has introduced, introduced its own code of professional responsibility but uh, coincidentally and maybe not so those two um, were primarily taken from the ASCLAD lab uh, guiding principles of professional responsibility. Well again that's a huge compliment and I can pass the compliment on to you because I know you worked in the development of those at the time um, but ASCLAD Lab did a lot of due diligence when those were put mm -hmm. together and looked at a lot of organizations such as IAI and others as to what they had in place to kind of build the best of the best at the time. So um, it's good to see that they're still be being used and or used as the foundation for other things. But, you're, but ANAB will not enforce those professional guidelines. No, again, that's not our role. And, and actually, when, when you look to how a, a, an accredited forensic service provider is conforming with that requirement, quite generally, that pushes you right into HR rules and HR processes mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on and just kind of walking through the types of topics that are covered in ISO IEC 17025, we see one that basically deals with the agreement to perform work. And since most of our laboratories are government laboratories, that's usually simply a submission form because they have statutory or administrative authority to perform the work. But for private laboratories, it often is a formal contract that actually is established. Uh, next, we will see that 17025 does allow for subcontracting of work as long as it's um, subcontracted to a competent subcontractor, so there are requirements there. Does that mean an accredited subcontractor? What does competent mean? Um, 17025 is very general. Uh, it, it does say it could be um, someone that is uh, conforming to these requirements, but you will notice that in the now ANAB merged requirements, we have stepped up the game and we require an accredited subcontractor if that's available and if appropriate. All right. So many labs outsource some of the DNA work uh, because there's a backlog in it. So now we can be more confident that that outsourcing is to a laboratory that is not just competent but perhaps accredited. Yes. Okay. All right. Going back to the topics that are covered in this standard, the next one is on purchasing services and supplies. And very simply put, there's just an acknowledgement that the quality of the um, consumables, uh, vendors, anything that would be used in the testing or calibration process impacts the quality of the output. So you have to pay attention to um, the services and supplies that you purchase. 
Uh, there's a section titled service to the customer, which just makes me smile because there is a requirement or two in here, but all of ISO 17025 is very focused on the customer and meeting the customer needs. Um, so uh, if, you, if you do a word search, you will find customer in 17025 a number of times. Next, I group these three sections together, although they are not in numerical order. You'll see that one is missing, but 4.8 on complaints, 4.9 on control of non-conforming work, and 4.11 on corrective action are all reactive mechanisms that a accredited forensic service provider will use when they need to. Um, and these include uh, halting and resuming of work. It includes evaluations of how significant the uh, non-conforming work might be. Uh, it it evals, includes um, notifications to customers where necessary and certainly includes that escalation to what we call corrective action to determine one or more uh, root causes for the issue as necessary. So can the public make a complaint to ANAB Forensics about a laboratory? They can. The process is for them to go to the forensic service provider first because all of the forensic service providers have procedures to deal mm -hmm. with complaints and they should be the one that gets the first opportunity to evaluate this and respond and potentially resolve the complaint mm -hmm. or act on the complaint. And we want to see that process working as it should. But if the complainant does not feel that they were responded to appropriately, then yes, ANAB does have a process that they can use to file the complaint with ANAB Forensics. We will evaluate it. We will see if it's within our purview. As you might imagine, mm -hmm. sometimes we get complaints that are not within our purview. But if they are, then we investigate them. All right. okay. So if someone has filed a complaint or with either the laboratory or ANAB, uh, is there a process for putting a, a laboratory on suspension or revoking their accreditation? Um, certainly ANAB has the right to suspend, which would be removing part of a scope of accreditation or withdraw, which would be removing all accreditation from a forensic mm -hmm. service provider. That's certainly within our right. Um, honestly, we, we don't have to go there very often. And the reason that we don't have to go there very often is that usually the forensic service provider will take action themselves um, and, and voluntarily withdraw uh, their entire accreditation or reduce the scope of their accreditation if in fact they have to um, halt testing in a particular discipline or for a particular type of testing for a, a significant period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, looking on through the standard, the next couple of sections to highlight are actually titled Improvement and Preventive Action. So here you see the proactive side of ISO IEC 17025 and the concept of continuous improvement. And the exciting thing that we see as is as an organization matures and has been accredited for a longer period of time, you see them using this proactive component much more frequently than you see them having to respond reactively. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just very encouraging. The next section is uh, titled Control of Records, and this is where you have requirements for the maintenance and sufficiency of records. NAB Forensics does, has, certainly has a number of requirements here, but they're not on any new topic. Uh, they're all about maintenance and sufficiency. And then the last two requirements in Section 4 on management requirements deal with um, an evaluation by the service provider themselves on their com continued conformance with the accreditation requirements and their evaluation of how effective their organization is. Next, jumping on into Section 5, um, probably the first thing of interest here is really Section 5.2 on personnel. And no surprise that 17025 has very basic requirements to ensure competence, uh, to train people appropriately, and to authorize them to perform work. But you will find um, ANAB forensic specific requirements here. We've already talked about the education requirements for those that issue a report. 
There are also specific elements that must be covered in the training programs, and there is a requirement for competency testing and the successful completion of competency testing prior to performing work. Looking on through the standard, the next uh, section is on the facility itself where the work is performed. Certainly that's um, important and probably no surprise that we add a forensic requirement that deals with security and access because we want to control that. Um, next is the section on testing calibration methods and method validation. And Ken, we've talked about that a little bit. Oops. We've already talked about that a little bit about how 17025 uses the term appropriate. Um, certainly requires validated methods. This is the section where we begin to talk about uncertainty of measurement and just the control of data. So are, are, do you require the uh, forensic service provider to develop measurement uncertainties and to report those in their report? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Um, to go a little bit farther, and you were, you were great in how you phrased your question because there are requirements about both. Actually estimating the measurement uncertainty has some mm -hmm. requirements, and then there are separate requirements for reporting them. Um, and in the merged uh, testing laboratory requirements that we're walking through here, the requirements for estimating it are for a quantitative test result. So mm -hmm. when the test result itself is a quantitative number, so two immediately come to mind, right? A blood alcohol test result or a weight of a seized drug. Mm -hmm. So they would estimate the measurement uncertainty there. And then the report requirements um, are directed by 17025, certainly it must be reported when it impacts a specification. So in our arena, that's a, a legal requirement, a statute level, and if the customer would require it. Right. Uh -huh. But this is something that the attorneys ought to recognize may be there, maybe not reported, but in the notes someplace. So when your sentence depends upon the amount of drugs or your conviction on driving under the influence may depend upon the percentage of blood alcohol. These measurement uncertainties are very important. Um, they are, and, and the laboratories would need to be reporting them if it could impact how that decision maker um, would be looking at that test result. Mm -hmm. Some laboratories have chosen just to report the estimated uncertainty for all blood alcohols or all drug weights, even though I would venture to bet greater than 95% of the test results truly are not right next to that right. legal limit, right? But sometimes it's just easier to report it for all, but mm -hmm. they don't have to. They can report it only when it's necessary for the evaluation of that um, specification. So certainly it is important to know that if it's not reported, that information is available to them. Okay. All right, moving on here, let's go ahead and look at the next section. Just there's a section on equipment, and it's, this is the equipment that's used to perform the testing or the calibration, and you can see the topics that are covered. Here we have measurement traceability, um, which measurement traceability is different than measurement uncertainty. Uh, this is how we actually tie a measurement made in a forensic laboratory to the international system of units. Um, so you're looking at me like maybe I should explain measurement traceability. Well, a little, a bit, little bit because it's important. If you're calibrating an instrument with a weight that's not traceable to uh, an international standard, then you don't know whether the calibration is correct, and that affects the outcome of the test. That's correct. So, um, could, so yes, could you explain that? <laughs> um, so uh, we do want calibrations of equipment done appropriately, and, and vendors are accredited to perform those calibrations. So the easiest way for me to explain measurement traceability is to bring it maybe to an example that everybody can relate to. If you're at the grocery store and you are um, buying, I don't know, a, a bunch of bananas, uh, it, it really is not going to matter which scale you weigh them on at that grocery store. You're going to get relatively the same answer. And it also would not matter if you took those and went to any other grocery store in that city, in that state, in any of the 50 United States, or if you took them to another country. Because all measurements of mass, weight, are tied back to the exact same international standard. And so that does allow us to compare um, test results from one laboratory to another. Um, so measurement traceability is key. 
Uh, it is slightly different than uncertainty. Measurement uncertainty is, is a part of measurement traceability, but measurement uncertainty then is going to quantify the confidence that you have in that mm -hmm. test result. It's going to quantify the expected variation if you perform that measurement again. Okay. Okay. I see before we move on, I see we do have a question. Thank you, uh, Sylvia. Her question is, does ANAB's complaint process include public recommend, rec, uh, reprimands as discussed for IEI certification earlier? The answer really is, I guess you would say it depends. If, if as a result of the complaint or the complaint investigation, there was a sanction by ANAB to the scope of accreditation, to the point that then we removed um, a discipline or we removed a type of testing from the scope of accreditation, then that would be publicly communicated because the scope would be changed and the revised scope would be published. Uh, but there's no um, other real publication process for the complaint. So how, how do you publicly uh, advertise that someone's scope has been reduced? I mean, um, can you go to the website and check? Yeah, it's it's posted there. It's part of our responsibility as a recognized accrediting body to to keep current information posted. All right. So before uh, a trial, both prosecutor and defense ought to go to, to your website to make sure that that laboratory's scope of accreditation had not been reduced uh, in such a way that would impact the testimony of the expert. Um, certainly, and I'm going to rephrase it slightly, but make sure that, that you understand what the scope of accreditation was when the testing was performed. Right. Because we all know that, um, that sometimes it takes a case as a long time to make it through the criminal mm -hmm. justice system. Mm -hmm. and, and so the scope of testing could be different at the time it was performed versus when the trial occurs. Right. Very good point. And, and thank you, Sylvia, for your question. All right, let's see, moving on here and looking just at the remaining sections here in 17.025, we won't spend much time on sampling. Um, I've given you basically the definition of sampling here on the slide. It's different than sample selection, so you can educate yourself on that by reading the documents. Uh, 5.8 and 17.025 is general in their regard of handling test items and calibrations. No surprise, we've got some forensic requirements here, and that deals with chain of custody. And then um, in 5.9, this is another area where we see a number of forensic specific requirements about assuring the quality of work. And uh, we addressed some of these already, Ken, where we talked about verification and what it is. We talked about technical review and what it is. And we did not spend much time on proficiency testing, but there are requirements for prof ongoing proficiency testing for the accredited locations as well as the staff that are performing the testing or the calibration work. So let me ask a couple questions about proficiency testing so I make sure I understand. What are the, how, many, how often does a laboratory have to engage in a proficiency test required by ANAB forensics? Um, for, for the program that we're talking about here, the, each location must participate in an external proficiency test, if it's available, um, annually per discipline. And then each individual that's performing testing work must complete successfully annually either an internal or external PD, PT. Right. The first one that you mentioned really tests the laboratory's competence or proficiency. That's, that's more the, the scope, right? That's right. the goal. Right. All right. And do you record when either the laboratory or the individual does not succeed at the uh, proficiency test? How do we know as lawyers before the expert gets on the stand how their lab or they as an individual uh, performed? You would need to ask that individual or that forensic service provider for the specific records. Those would not generally come from us, but to the first part of your question, do we monitor it? Absolutely. All right, so that takes me back to a question kind of as a follow-up of Sylvia's, but also with regard to this. If I were a defense attorney and I wanted to know about their last accreditation and, and what they had to have corrective action in, or their performances on proficiency tests, will you give that to us by a call to you and saying, 
tell us about this lab? No. So, no. well, I can subpoena it. Um, I'm sure you can, and we would follow that process. Okay. Um, but generally, that information is just obtained from the forensic service providers. Because they um, will have it all. They, so they have it all. A discovery request Correct. to them or a subpoena to them might do the job without coming to ANAB Correct. Forensics. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. In finishing this up, the last section in the standard is uh, 5.10, and it's on reporting of results. And over on the right-hand side, side of the slide there, you can see kind of the general overarching requirement in 17025 to report tests accurately, clearly, unambiguously, and objectively. The standard does um, have a list of information that is to be included in a test report or a calibration certificate. It requires opinions and interpretations to be marked as such and also has requirements if a re an amended report is issued. Um, ANAB, again, in the forensic sector, we have some additional requirements here regarding um, clearly defining, acknowledging, describing, whatever word you would like to use there, the significance of any associations reported, also the requirement to report the results of database searches, uh, requirements when measurement uncertainty is reported, and also finally for the use of our accreditation symbol, which have become more important again now that you, um, they don't have to seek accreditation for all of the testing that they perform. Mm -hmm. We would want the accreditation symbol only used on reports that are within the scope of accreditation. All right, that's important to know. But so going back to the report, uh, there are a lot of um, reports coming out that are recommending uh, what should be in a report, including the National Commission on Forensic Science, the latent print report uh, from NIST, an upcoming report on um, handwriting analysis and so forth. So if the laboratories start to adopt these guidelines, what are the three ways that they can provide the information without giving an attorney, you know, a stack this high of, of information? Um, well, if, it, if it's truly needed for the interpretation of the report, it, it needs to be in the report itself or an annex provided with the report. Okay. Because if, if the customer needs to get it, we need to make sure that we get that information to them. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you're, you're really referring to the option to potentially keep some information in the technical record. And, and, and that, again, that may or may not be appropriate depending on what the information is. Um, certainly behind every test report, you have all of the technical records that support the forensic service provider coming to that test result that they are issuing. Um, and so uh, maybe the message is, is that the test report is not all there is. Um, right. and, and attorneys may want to request the technical records. So does ISO in a section that refers to reporting indicate that if it's not in the report or it's not in the annex, it has to be in the case record which is accessible to the customer? Um, it's, not, it's not in ISO where that's referred to. It's actually in a document by another organization that we have mm -hmm. not talked about today. It's ILAC, which is mm -hmm. the International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation who oversees our recognition. And they have a guidance document that deals with forensic science and they do talk about that if there's a legal restriction on reporting, then it is acceptable to keep some of the elements that ISO requires be in the report just in the technical records. Um, so that may be what you're referring to. 17025 does also allow a forensic service provider or a provider to have, to issue what's called a simplified report um, based on either the fact that they're reporting to an internal customer or on written agreement with an external customer. And in that case, then yes, any of the information that would be agreed upon that does, 
to not have to go in the report would still have to be in the technical record and provided if requested. Okay, very good. So I'm going to stop asking questions and let you get through the remainder of your slides All right. in the next six minutes. Okay, okay, I can do it. I can meet the challenge. All right. All right, so um, we're done looking through the 2005 version, and now we're just going to look very briefly at what's coming down for these changes for these forensics uh, laboratories based on the new 2017 version of ISO, IEC 17025. And although there's a structural requir structural uh, reformatting, I will tell you all of the topics that we have talked about today are still in the 2017 version of ISO 17025. There is a philosophy change, though, um, which I talk about over the next three slides. And the first one is that it's more process-oriented. The requirements in the 2017 version focus on the what is required and not the how. So the requirements no longer get to, they're not as descriptive about the specific tasks or steps that need to be performed, just the overall objective. The next change you'll see is the, um, change in how requirements are worded and some of the things that are included to acknowledge the change in information technology that has occurred since the 2005 version and really the um, just the automation that's happening in all types of testing or calibration laboratories again not only forensic and then the last uh, part of the philosophy change is this concept of risk-based thinking and many of the requirements in the 2017 version require a, an accredited, in our case, forensic service provider to identify potential risk, assess um, the likelihood of that risk, determine what action they are going to take, um, implement uh, actions to minimize that risk, and also implement actions to monitor and control for any risk that they've mm -hmm. identified. The rationale is there on the slide, but they really feel like taking this approach with the way the requirements are worded, again, allows um, forensic service providers of different size, different scope, different um, organizations to work most effectively and efficiently. So it'll be interesting to see how mm -hmm. this, how this gets um, moved forward in the next years. So I'm not going to spend too much time on these last slides. I think I might just let the audience read it um, and just kind of summarize it that accreditation really provides this foundation to establish a culture of quality so that the work product of the forensic service provider, which is the test report or the testimony, to be of a high quality. And the impact of culture on the employees cannot be overemphasized. Um, and it is the management's responsibility to uh, establish the culture, uh, what the mission and the vision and the values are, um, and to realize the importance of how this interplays with how the employees interact with each other, management, and importantly, the customers and the stakeholders. Um, and all of this boils down to this concept and this mindset of continuous improvement and being proactive and data-based as opposed to reactive. Um, but I'm going to end here with saying that the decision that, that those that were involved with ASCLAD back in the 70s to begin a program of accreditation as one of the best tools in the toolbox to increase the quality of the work along with personal certification, I think they made the right decision. Good. Well, thank you very much. I have one question before we uh, and we still have a, a minute or two. Uh, it seems that ISO 17025 and its new version is very important for lawyers to understand and to be able to uh, discuss with experts on the stand uh, in their particular case. How do they get a copy of ISO 17025? Is it on the web someplace where you can get the full version? They have to purchase it, and the local U.S. Um, place to do so is with ANSI. So they can type in ansi.org and they can search for ISO IEC 17025. You also can purchase it directly from iso.org. So right. either place. It's a copyrighted it document, is. I understand. Mm -hmm. And how expensive is it? I haven't checked. You haven't checked. You get yours for free. <laughs> well, we buy one. <laughs> you buy <but> one? <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> well, thank you both very much for your very insightful comments. I thought that was great, and I think it really goes to showing how the forensic community is focused on competency and, uh, and uh, quality and so forth. So I, I appreciate both of your time here today. You're very welcome. So thank you all for joining us on today's webinar. Please continue to check the spotlight section of our homepage on ncstl.org for information on upcoming webinars. All webinars are available on demand and can be found on the education and training page of our website. Please make sure to fill out the survey that you will be receiving by email. We'd really appreciate this. This survey will en enable you to receive your CLE information. Contact our Office at, of Professional Education at OPE at law dot stetson dot edu for further information or questions. So on behalf of Stetson College of Law, the National Clearing House, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, my guest speakers, and myself, thank you for attending.